Well, let's start with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this group that's come together to study your word. And as we approach this topic of our identity with the environment, I pray that you will lead, that you have led in the preparation, that you'll lead in the presentation, and as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So today, our topic is uh, environmental identity. Now this is maybe a little bit of a less controversial subject around here than some of the ones I've talked about, but it's still controversial, uh, partially because our church doesn't have a lot of um, solid stand on this subject, which I think is good because I think that our church needs to avoid making stands on things that we can't agree on. Sometimes they'll make statements from up on high, and we're like, wait a second, the people in the, uh, in the church don't believe that's biblical, right? So um, if we can't come to a biblical consensus on a detail, just let people um, explore that. So what you're hearing is my opinion, um, not necessarily my church's opinion today. But I do think that the environment is something that has been very divisive and actually in a lot of ways there's a paradox in that in that when when you see what you see is typically evolutionists care for the environment and creationists don't care for the environment at least that's the way it's pre presented and and i wonder why would evolutionists care about preserving the environment after all the basic idea of evolution is that through completely complete chance, undirected chance, and through more powerful creatures dominating and controlling and destroying the weaker creatures, things got better to where they are now, right? So, you know, the dinosaurs had to clear out the competition and we've had to clear out competition and so on. And so the idea of creatures, stronger creatures killing off weaker ones combined with blind undirected uh, chance has led us to where we are, so wouldn't it make sense that we as the humans could just do whatever we want with the weaker species and it would make things better, evolutionary speaking. Uh, but that's not what they believe because they tend to be very concerned about the environment and we'll see in a little bit why that is. On the other hand, when we look at creationists, we see that God intentionally made this planet and he made it perfect, and man's actions, particularly sin, has degraded that planet. And so, um, so really, logically speaking, the environmentalists should be the Christians, not the evolutionists. But that's how it seems to be flipped. I recently heard a famous preacher, in fact, I'll just say his name because he's on YouTube, so it's not like he's hiding it. It was John MacArthur. And he was talking about environmentalism, and he was essentially saying, look, the earth is there for our pleasure. Do whatever you want. Go, go burn some trash, kill a fish, whatever. Just do whatever you want. It's there just for your pleasure. You know? And I thought, I don't know if that really fits with my understanding of what the Bible says about God's creation. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, because just about all this stuff is in Genesis Actually, I have it up here on the screen. Genesis chapter 1, when it talks about creating humans, it says, Then God, this is verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So our command is, in this passage, twice. We're to have dominion over everything on the earth. But it also says we are to be fruitful and multiply. So... Um, Currently, there's this idea that the earth is overpopulating and that people are the problem. 
Um, some more extremists think we need to just sort of get rid of the human population, let the rest of the world, you know, survive. I think less extreme ones would say we just need to figure out some way to either do better birth control or kill more babies before they're born, of course. Um, yeah. Evolutionists also are bringing in the dinosaur era. Was man here before a dinosaur? Was Adam and Eve here before dinosaurs? They're bringing that topic in too. Well, technically, dinosaurs were here before man, but just slightly, same day. They would have been created on the sixth day, but man was created last on the sixth day. So, so God created, uh, we're created in God's image, and for a purpose, we are to have dominion over the earth and everything in it. So, some people see this dominion, as, and like John MacArthur, they'll say, oh, well, you can do whatever you want with it. Essentially, brutalize it. Dig where you want to dig, take what you want to take, whatever. It's yours, do what you want with it. But is that what godly dominion looks like? I mean, if you think about how does God cr treat the creatures that he has dominion over us, right? How does he treat us? Does he use us for his own advantage? Does he just do whatever he wants and who cares about us? No, that's really how Satan does. When Satan has somebody following him, he will make things seem good until he's got you. And then what will he do? He'll use you for his own advantage. So if we are created in God's image to have dominion, that would imply that we are somewhat God's representatives on this earth to take care of the earth. We should do it in a way that God would do it. And I don't think God would do it in a torturous, destructive way. Uh, that's not how God deals with the things that he cares about. So um, the next place we find indication about what our responsibility is with the environment is in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 15, it says that God planted this garden called Eden, and it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to do two things, to tend and to keep it. The word tend, avad, is to work, serve, labor. Now, obviously, we're not laboring and in, in all that in a difficult way, right? Because... Uh, he wasn't at, at that point because it was perfect, right? But there's this idea of working it, to serving it, laboring it. Now, when we understand that he has dominion, he's serving it not from a position of a slave, but rather serving it from the position that, you know, God serves us, right? He's our master, but he, he cares for us. And then, so that's the 10. The word to keep is um, shamar, shamar. And it means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, to take charge of. It could even have a sense of preserving. And again, Adam in the in Garden of Eden, he didn't need to preserve it because it wasn't in danger before sin, right? But there is this idea that he is there to be, to yeah, to be a guardian of it. So he's to work in it, to serve, and to keep and protect and guard this garden that he's been given and the earth in general as the one who has dominion. So here God puts humans on the earth to be its loving caretaker and preserver. And then sin into the world. Did, hum did humans' roles change when sin entered the world? Well, we looked at that from the, when we talked about marriage roles, and we saw that to a little degree. Um, especially we saw that um, a wife's role didn't change. It just became more difficult. And we briefly went over the husband's role, but today's the day when we go over it in more detail. So we go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Then to Adam he said, Because you heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So 
he's still caring for the earth, right? He's still tilling it. He's still pr producing food with it. It's now a much, much more difficult thing for him to do. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Uh, continuing on here. So just like with the case with the woman's curse, which didn't change her role, just made it more difficult. The man's curse did not change his job, just made it more difficult and painful. Before sin, the relationship between God, or God's creatures, or God's creation, and the humans that he made to care for it was perfectly harmonious. There's no thorns to cut Adam and Eve. No weeds choked out other plants. Um, when Adam decided to, you know, maybe put a rose over here, it just was over there, you know. Um, things just went really smoothly. And animals were peaceful and, and tame. You know, there's no death before sin, so obviously there weren't even carnivores. And I remember back in 2005 reading an article, and I tried to find the article. I found a different one from National Geographic about it, but um, the one I read back then, which was fresher, was was actually more was had more details. But there's a group of 12 conservationists who took an expedition uh, to the Foja Mountains. I think I'm saying that right. It's a tropical South Pacific island of New Guinea. And so this is an area where it's very remote. There's a tribe of people who live around that area and they were friendly and kind of guided them. But there was this one place where even they didn't go. It was considered to be sacred ground and no one would go into it. And so this was December of 2005. They went into this area. Now there had been one other guy back in the 70s who had gone into that area, not the same part of it that this group went, but into those mountains. But otherwise, it had hardly been reached by anybody. But as far as they know, they were the first humans to ever be in this particular area. And they found dozens of new species that they'd never seen before. They had a tree climbing um, kangaroo sort of thing that was, that was pretty cool. A bunch of frogs, a bunch of birds. And one thing that they kind of do is interesting is that the animals did not seem to have a natural fear of humans. And so things would just come right up to them. Um, it, it, uh, why was nobody in there? Because the, the local tribes people saw it as a sacred site. Okay. And we don't know how long back it had been. Okay. So it's not to say that no one had ever been there. Yeah. But in, in the memory of anyone, the local people or anyone else, no one had been in there. And so these animals, they, they didn't have a natural fear of humans. So you can imagine they had to be very careful not to destroy animals just sort of walking your way, especially they found one frog that was like a half an inch long, fully grown. Be, be easy to stomp that thing accidentally, you know? So you have to be very careful. It, they've had a few more expeditions, I found out this week. They've had a few more expeditions, but not, it's mostly just been conservation, so they've been careful. That, the idea was, that they were saying, did they find heaven, right? And obviously no one thought it was the actual heaven or the actual Garden of Eden, but it's like, it has this idea of how the harmonious nature probably was without, um, without anybody in there to hunt the animals. I mean, obviously, animals probably still hunted each other, but no humans at the top of the food chain. Anyway, so that, I think we need to go see that personally, but probably we'll never do it. Probably be easier to get to space nowadays. <laughs> um, so the passage goes on. It says, Then the Lord God said, uh, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden um, of Eden to till the ground for which he was taken. So he drove the man out and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every which way 
to guard the way to the tree of life. So he sends them out to do what? To till the ground. And that word till is the same word that's used in chapter 2 for dressing the earth or, or tending the earth. It's the same word in Hebrew. So again, the, the job of humanity was still the same. It's just going to be more painful. It's going to be more difficult. Now the earth is going to rebel against our, our training of it, right? Our care for it. And that's what we see. If you've ever gardened, you know, the earth rebels. Like, I've got this perfect place. I've got this perfect place for this plant. And if no weeds ever come in, this plant will grow really well. Does the, does the earth go along with that? No. I've got to keep pulling the weeds. I've got to keep pulling the weeds. Um, because the earth is now rebelling as a result of sin. So the role of humans has not changed. We're still to care for the earth. We're still to, again, serve, care for, preserve. Those are the words that we're connected with it. And um, it's just a more contrary sort of um, attitude. So now my plan is not to take a side on the global warming debate, whether man-made global warming debate is real. I have my opinions, but I think there's plenty of people giving their opinions without backing them up, and I don't need to add mine to that. Um, there's models, and we're going to see in a little bit that many of those models have failed. My issue with modern environmentalism, the evolutionary style, is not their concern for the earth because we've seen that as humans we should, be care we should con be concerned about God's creation, about the earth. It's that environmentalism has become a religion. So it's, with some of the stuff I share, it's going to be hard to separate that from the idea that maybe what we're doing is affecting the earth negatively. I think it is in some way. Whether it's, whether it's mass like some people say, or whether it's minor, we obviously have had some negative effect on the earth. We brought sin into the earth, right? So I'm not denying that, that humans have had a negative impact on, on our planet, but environmentalism has moved beyond what God has assigned Christians to, to becoming a religion itself. And I think this is one reason why Christians sometimes are, are so afraid to care for the environment or say anything about it, because they're trying to counteract the, the environmental religion of the um, seculars. They keep building to us because of that. And that works to the point that I don't think we can turn it around at all. So, um, so historian and professor Joshua J. Mark, who is not a religious person from what I can tell, he wrote that there is no culture recorded in human history that has not practiced some form of religion. And that seems to be what I've noticed as well. Religion is hard baked into us. In fact, um, Mark is he's not coming from a religious perspective. The article that I got this from, it's in worldhistory.org. It strongly implies that he believes that all religion is just made up. Right? So he's not... He's not promoting religion here, but what he says should give us pause to think, why is it that religion is so prevalent? Why is it that every culture has had religion? As a Christian, I would say that God set up the first religion. He's reformed it a few times, right? All other religions are Satan's distractions. Satan knows that we have a need for religion, a need for worship. And he's only too happy to provide for that need with false religion. And some people say, well, religion is bad. Faith in God, God is important. No, good religion is good. Bad religion is bad. You know, Christianity is a religion, whether you like the word or not. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. In fact, it's, it's a good thing. But he continues. Um, well, it may be an interesting exercise in cultural exchange to attempt tracing the origins of religion it does not seem very worthwhile, a very worthwhile use of one's time, when it seems fairly clear that the religious impulse is simply a part of the human condition, and different cultures in different parts of the world could have come to the same conclusions about the meaning of life independently. 
So, so I, yeah, I agree with, with Mark that, um, Joshua Mark, that religion is part of the human condition because God created us for companionship with the divine. And in a sense, we're created also for partnership with the divine because we're carrying out God's plans on earth. We are to have dominion over the earth to act as stewards over the planet that he's given us. But when society rejects God, we naturally have to find something else to worship. And so we've clearly seen that it's our job to care for the planet that he gave us. But what happens when we reject God and turn our job, which is caring for the earth, into our religion? If you go to Romans chapter 1, we've been to this passage before. We went through it in great detail. I think it was last time uh, we went into it in great detail. I realized as I was going through this that this is based in Genesis, but in at least three of these talks, we've, we've also found some major content in Romans chapter 1. Um, Romans chapter 1, verse 22. I'm not going to review the whole thing because we've been over that section many times, but it's talking about when people reject God and then he gives them up to their sin and, and then they start doing things that are very self-harmful, right? Um, and harmful to the planet, everything. But verse 22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So now I'm going to say that this passage only applies to these last days because people have been worshiping the creature rather than the creator for um, all a long time. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I put the wrong verse up there because when you go on, it actually uses that word worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Let me see if I can find that. It's verse 25 who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So, of course, throughout history, there's been idolatry, people making things that are created. Um, oh, here it is, right there. I guess it just hadn't gotten there yet. God gave them up to uncleanness, etc. So there's a verse. So, but we, we've seen that throughout history. They, they, the Egyptians, they worshipped different animals, right? Um, Canaanites made their own creatures to worship, their own idols. Actually, a lot of society has. But we have done this in our culture, too. The truly wise people reject creation, right? Those who, th who are considered truly wise, they reject creation. Well, how can you just believe that there's some God up there in, in, in space that just did all that? How does that make sense? Instead, they have this elaborate method which actually isn't any more plausible than creation. We, talked, we looked at that at the very beginning, but it's considered to be wiser. You know? I don't know if you remember, um, I think it was when George W. Bush was running for president, they, they, somebody asked whether he believed in creation. And, um, and the, he kind of dodged the question because if you, they were saying, look, if you believe in creation, you're not smart enough to run our country. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that was what they're trying to imply. Look, if you believe in creation. So the, the truly wise people, they reject that. And instead, what they do, they've turned the creature into the creator. Through evolution, we've seen how that, we've already seen how through evolution, death becomes our creator rather than our enemy but also in the sense of worshiping Mother Earth. And so um, we see this happening in a godless society. We've moved from beyond, beyond being stewards of, Mother, uh, stewards of the Earth to making Mother Earth our God. And essentially, it's become an environmental religion. And we find a lot of the elements of a false religion in modern environmentalism. 
Again, not to be confused with caring for the earth in a Christian sort of way. So most false religions, I think actually all false religions are based on fear, right? You, they thrive off of fear. If you do the wrong thing, the God will do something bad to you, right? And, and so what, we, what religious practice is for, according to false religions, religious practice is to keep the gods either happy with you or at least not too angry at you. That's where Christianity is so different because in Christianity, God loves us and he makes a sacrifice to save us rather than us having to make sacrifices to appease him. Huge difference. Yeah. But don't you think that the early days, people hurt God back then, and so they didn't know what to do with that voice. So they ended up having, some could hear God, and that's how they had their witch doctors, healing, all this other stuff, but they didn't know the Christianity. So now as we reach this world and we're bringing in Christianity, they're like, that voice I hear is God speaking. So all these things that they had, that they built not knowing who it was, I believe, is now becoming the understanding in the Christianity world, in the places well I think the idea of religion came from a true religion but it's been corrupted um, but just because they're hearing something doesn't mean they're hearing God's spirit because there's an evil spirit that communicates with with, other, with people too so um, and, and, the, and you find that in the evidence of how the religions are You've got to do something to appease these false religions. Um, and then throughout history, religions have used this natural phenomenon that people, you know, natural phenomenon like um, hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, they use those to instill fear into people and control them, gain power. Um, Baal was uh, one of the most famous Canaanite gods and this is an actual um, idol that was dug up by some archaeologists. Andrews University owns this. And I happened to be walking past their booth. And the guy was, I don't remember whether he was cleaning the case or just tra transitioning things out. He said, hey, would you hold this for, for me for a second? And he hands it to me. I'm holding this statue of Baal that's like 3,000 or 4,000 years old. That was kind of a weird thing. In this picture, he's holding it. Because I said, hey, I need to get a picture of this thing, right? But so this is a literal, this isn't a replica. This is the real deal. It was heavy. I think the thing was made out of iron because it was really heavy. Um, so I have held a false god before. And believe me, it had no power. Except maybe some power to make my arm tired, you know? But anyway, so this is Baal. Baal was, of course, a fertility god because they all were, right? But specifically, the Canaanites believed that he was the god who had control of moisture, whether it be rain, dew, or even storms. And so if there's a storm that comes up and it's, it's too harsh, you're going to make a sacrifice to Baal, right? Um, Baal, by the way, is what, what we normally call it, but it would have been Baal in, in their language. And by the way, up here, they think that in this guy's hand right there, there used to be a lightning bolt that got broken off because he's you know throwing the thunder and lightning down at you so um, it, it's just a little hat sort of thing um, are there symbols in the hat maybe um, I didn't examine it really closely but and actually I think it might be broken off on the top because other ones that I found online have a much taller hat this one isn't super tall um, but, you know, things can happen when you're sitting in the ground for thousands of years. Um, it's actually rather well preserved, I think. You can even see, like, the, the, on the skirt there, there's the little, yeah, the lines and all that. The trim, that's the word for it. Anyway, so basically, in the old time religion, the God 
controlled the weather and, and so you had to do something to appease them if you didn't like what the weather was. Well, in much the same way, environmentalism can actually be very similar to that. And there's a lot of fear, putting fear out there. I recently heard that a lot of climate scientists, even the ones who um, believe the general man-made climate is going to destroy the earth sort of thing, they get frustrated with what's being put out by the media, by politicians and so on, because it's it says it's over the top from what we're finding in, in real research. I have a few quotes here, though. Um, these, are, these are just examples. I could come up with a lot more of how fear is used to get people in line with the religion of climate. The world has been chilling sharply. This was written in 1970. The world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years. If present trends continue, the world will be about four degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but 11 degrees colder in the year 2000. This is about twice what it would take to put us into an ice age. How have you been enjoying our ice age recently? That's Kenneth Watt. I think we went the opposite. Um, C.C. Yeah. Walden of the World Meteorologi Meteorological Society in 1975. And really this, this modern religious sort of environmental movement seems to have started in the 70s. I wasn't alive then, but that's what it seems like from what I can tell. Uh, the cooling since 1940 has been large enough to, and consistent enough that it will not soon be reversed. And Nigel Calder, a scientist, said the threat of a new ice age must now stand alongside nuclear war as a likely source of wholesale death and misery for mankind. So that's... Um, People all afraid, right? And it's not just, well, this is fear. Now you've got to do what we tell you to do in order to um, change that. Then the, the attitude changed. So this is, um, let's see, this is quoted in the San Jose Mercury News. And this is from Noel Brown. Um, the entire entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if global warming, now we're in global warming, is not reversed by the year 2000. Coastal flooding and crop failures would create an exodus of echo refugees, threatening political chaos, said Noel Brown, director of the New York Office of the UN Environment Program. So this isn't just some random person, that's a pretty high position there. So again, if we don't do something about this, whole cities are going to be wiped off the map. Well, we have had one whole city wiped off the map, but it was because of a bad dike. I'm talking about New, uh, New Orleans. It was because of a bad dike, not because of, you know, necessarily because of global warming. And it wasn't wiped off the map. They rebuilt it. But um, in 2000, climate scientist David Viner, in a viral interview with the UK Independent, said that snow on the Isles, the British Isles, was going to be a very rare and exciting event. Children just aren't going to know what snow is. We're really going to get caught out. Snow will probably cause chaos in 20 years time. And you can see that if you've ever lived in Texas or in Alabama, when snow comes, it really throws people because they don't know what to do with it, right? He's saying, well, that'll just be all of Britain. Like, it'll be so warm. Well, then it became a problem because this stuff didn't happen. And so um, John Holdren, director of the Office of Science and Technology and Policy in 2014, came up with an explanation for this. A growing body of evidence suggests that the kind of extreme cooling being experienced by much of the United States as we speak is a pattern we can expect to see with increasing frequency as global warming continues. So it's suppo we're supposed to get warmer and we won't have snow. Oh wait, we have snow. Well, that's also part of global warming. That's just the bad weather patterns. Now, have humans affected the weather patterns? I think we have, at, through sin, if nothing else, right? But um, my point is they're not doing a very good job of, of predicting what's going to happen. Instead, they're just using it to bring up fear, and fear ends up being what forces people into the religion. July of 2009, Britain's Prince Charles 
said that he had calculated that we had 96 months, that's eight years, left to save the world from a climate disaster. He called for a worldview and economic overhaul to save the planet. Notice now we're not just talking about how the planet is in trouble, but in order to solve this, we've got to change our worldview and our, and our economic system to save the planet. We face the dual challenges of a worldview and economic system that seem to have enormous shortcomings together with an environmental crisis, including that of climate change, which threatens to engulf us all. So you can see how taking this, there's the fear, and now we've got to have a change of worldview. What is worldview? It's basically the religious lens that we look at the world through. Um, let's see. I maybe put too many of these in here. Um, so this guy believed that in 25 years, this is back in 1970, between 75 and 80 percent of all species of animals would be extinct. The current, um, the current rate is that, um, uh, what was the pres Environmental Trust or something like that, one of the environmental ag agencies is saying about 0.01 percent of species uh, are regularly becoming extinct. So long ways away from 75 to 80. Now, we don't want any of them unless they're mosquitoes. I'm, I'm all in favor of mosquitoes becoming extinct. Um, yeah, ticks. Yeah, we could probably make a list of animals we want to go extinct, right? But um, this one here, I, I put in as kind of a transition because we look at the fear here, but we also see that there's an element of coercion, of, of early early indoctrinating. In March of, uh, March 2, 2022, so this year, Reuters reported that one in five children are having nightmares about climate change in Britain. A survey of 2,000 children aged 8 to 16 conducted by this pollster here found that um, two in five, or 41%, did not trust adults to tackle the climate crisis. Further, 58% were worried about the impact that the climate change will have on their lives. And I don't think that's just in Britain. You see that is a major concern because that's what they're being fed constantly. You need to be afraid. You need to change your worldview. We need to, we need to essentially serve Mother Earth instead of caring for it. So now at the outset, I said I wasn't going to take a, a position on whether man-made climate change is real. And my intent with these things wasn't to show whether they exist or not, but to show how fear has been used to promote it. And, um, and the idea is that if we don't do what we're told to do, if we don't follow the new religion, this world will turn into hell. And I say hell because it'll be hot. A hot place, right? Um, so this time, instead of telling people that we need to sacrifice to a little iron statue, Baal, um, they're saying that we must sacrifice our freedom to worldwide governance, because if it's a worldwide problem, you have to have a worldwide plan, and therefore you have to have a worldwide government to, to or at least power, to take control of it. In his famous documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, former Vice President Al Gore um, brought in the next section, that is, this new environmental religion has its morality. Um, so he frames this in a moral, in a moral sense. He's just explained how the CO2 really curve goes up. Ultimately, this is really not a political issue so much as a, a moral issue. If we allow that to happen, it is deeply unethical. So it's not a political issue. It's not a science issue, it's a moral issue. He didn't say science, I added that in, but it's a moral issue. This is now a moral thing, it's a, it's a question of ethics. If we don't do anything we can to keep those CO2 levels from rising, it's immoral, um, not just wise, right? Having more efficient cars, um, being vegetarian, by the way, has a bigger impact on the CO2 levels than driving an electric car does. 
because it turns out agriculture pollutes more than all the cars altogether. So, um, but, but here we see we're switching from, well, here's a fact, let's deal with it in a scientific sort of way. Let's, let's try to figure out how we can engineer a solution because that's what people have always done. Instead, we're dealing with a moral question now. And if, it's, if there's a moral question, then if you don't fit in with the doctoral, doctrinal conformity, then there's a problem, right? And so a lot of times people won't hear contravening facts. By the way, this is on both sides. The people like the, the John MacArthur's in the world, um, and again, I'm picking on him just because he's made this statement. I don't know what he believes all the way around that, but a lot of people on that side, they wouldn't even listen. Like if you gave them evidence that humanity is having a negative effect on the planet, they wouldn't listen to that either because it doesn't fit their doctrinal conformity. So it works both ways. Um, we have early indoctrination of children. We've seen how children, at least in the UK, but ever, they're, they're having literal nightmares over this thing that, um, that really shouldn't be causing them not nightmares. Um, and part of this false theology is that humans are a blight on the earth. There are some, again, on the extreme side, there are some who think we just need to eliminate the humans and let the earth go along just fine. Um, as if people being on the earth is the problem. Biblically speaking, God put people on the earth to care for it. So we're the solution, not the problem, right? According to the Bible, we should be the solution because we're to be the stewards of the earth. So as such, I'm all for coming up with ways to be more environmentally friendly as humans because God set us up to care for the earth. Then there's, then there's sins that we can commit, environmental sins, like polluting, right? Not recycling, driving an SUV when you could be driving a little car, whatever the sins are of the moment, flying in a private jet unless you're, you know, wealthy, and then you can do it in... Using plastic straws. Using plastic straws, yes. <laughs> and, and a lot of times we, we mock those things, but there are people who take this very seriously, very, very seriously. That, that new kind of straw, I can't remember what it is, but it's a new straw that is environmentally safe. Yeah, the paper straws. They're actually old straws. So They're coming back. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. Yeah, because the, they can degrade into the ground or something like that. Um, but along with sins, in any false religion that's going to say there's a sin, they're also going to have a penance, right? Um, you know, we believe in repentance. That's very different than penance, right? Penance is you're doing something to pay for your sin, to appease the gods, or in this case, Mother Earth. So what, 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 how do we do penance? What if you run a big company and you have to pollute? Well, you can buy a carbon offset and you can let someone else pay for your sin, right? So somebody else produces energy to a green method. So they're essentially paying for your sin. When I was in Nebraska, this was a big deal because we had a lot of, Nebraska is the perfect place for wind turbines because the, the wind is pretty much between 15 and 18 miles an hour, which is exactly what you want. And it's constant, day, night, all the time. It's always blowing like that. And, and the other problem with windmills is they're ugly. But it's Nebraska, there's no view to break up. So you, they just have windmills all over the place. The wind's perfect. The problem is there's not enough people there to use all the energy that's, that's being produced by these. And ironically, the energy that's produced by them is so expensive that even though they were all around us, our city bought coal energy. That's so strange. I don't know why. I, I asked the city, well, when, when we had the wildfire and burned down the parsonage, we had all this land back there. I said, do you want to put up a windmill there? He said, no, it's cheaper for us to buy coal, coal energy. So anyway, um, so, what we're, so, so I asked him, so why are all these wind turbines out here if, if um, we're not using them, you know? And, and he said, actually, a lot of the energy is literally just being dumped. Well, because in certain states, he mentioned Florida, they have regulations. A certain percentage of the amount of energy you produce has to be green energy. Right. Well, they don't want to do it in Florida because land's so valuable and the views are so nice and the wind's not great, I guess, down there. Well, it's probably pretty windy down there too, I would imagine. But, not but not, yeah, probably not consistent. 
And so what they do is they go produce wind in Nebraska to offset their production of wind by, or of energy by coal and nuclear and whatever else they're using down in Florida. So they're just producing wind just to, just to make it legal. So they're basically paying their penance because of the sin that they want to commit uh, down there in Florida and probably other states. So what I wondered is if they're dumping it, why aren't they selling it, at least selling it super cheap to the locals so that we could at least have cheap energy and, you know, energy was pretty cheap there in Nebraska anyway, but, um, but yeah. So, you know, they still wouldn't be able to use it all because like I said, they, what they ought to do is put some data centers out there because um, those take a lot of energy. Then you also have control, right? With false religion, you have control. You've got to keep people under control. And with, with this environmental religion, you've got to have worldwide control if you're going to take care of, of people. It's, it's almost like a, that famous New World Order sort of thing where they've got to have their control. They've got to keep, keep in control. Um, and so rather than trying to force all the nations to unite, they just sign these pacts, you know, these agreements. And then you also have um, an apocalypse, eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. Of course, the Bible tells us about an apocalypse, right, at the end of time. It tells us about the study of end times things. But we saw how the religion of climate has their apocalypse. The earth is going to end with the destruction of humanity and probably all the other species because we destroyed ourselves. Um, and the only way to solve that is to go along with what the dogma is and to try to, they keep moving the goalpost of when the last moment is to make these changes and then from there on, it's pointless. And finally, you don't see this so much in the environmental area, but in the other part of modern religion, which we'll look at, I think, in two, week, or in two sessions, is this idea of a utopia, of the final things will finally get perfect if we follow the rules. And again, that's really more economic than um, climate, but if we did everything right, then things could get back in, into the right order, um, which in many cases includes reducing the human population by a whole lot. So um, now we believe in the separation of church and state, right? We believe that true Christianity is based on free choice, never forced, and that would demand that the church and state are separate. But what we now see is that there's a new religion that's not a religion called secularism that's harnessing the power of the government to enforce its dogma. It claims to be unreligious, and even claims that if you don't enforce and agree with their non-religion, that you're actually forcing your religion on them. So there's this idea among a lot of Christians that, that somehow the secular view is non-religious, so the government should enforce that. And, but really, it has the, all the bearings of a religion as well. It just doesn't have a deity up there. The deity is Mother Earth and self. It all always comes down to self, right? Um, so we've got the moral code. We've got the God, Mother Earth, and self with the moral code. Sins, a way to pay for those sins, to atone for those sins. Persecution of heretics. Like if you don't get in line, you'd probably be um, knocked out from that. So let's look at this last part about eschatology. Will we destroy the earth? First place to look is Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And let's see here. All right, Revelation chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 8. This is the seventh trumpet. All right, 18, I'm sorry. I thought that didn't look right. Okay, Revelation 11, verse 18, the seventh trumpet says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, 
and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that you should reward your saints and the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So there is this idea of humans destroying the earth, right? And there, and there being a, a penalty for that. Now, does that mean total destruction? No, it doesn't, because when we look to other passages about the end times, we find that the one who actually destroys the earth in, in the long run is God, not us. So we have destroyed the earth through our sin, through our corruption, and yes, through our irresponsible acts on the earth. But to talk about a complete destruction of the earth, we're not, we are, according to the Bible, we're not going to be doing that. We're not going to be able to completely destroy the earth because the Bible says that it's God who does this. First Peter chapter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So what's going to be the destruction of the earth? When the day of the Lord comes, when the Lord actually is the one who will bring destruction of the earth. And then all, everything will be burned up, not because of climate change, but because of climate destruction from God and cleansing. And then you find a new earth and a new heaven that comes about. And that's good news. And then, um, and so it says, what manner ought you to be? In holy conduct, good conversation, godliness, looking for and hastening that day. So yes, we should take care of the earth, but the primary thing we should be ha doing is hastening the day when this happens. How do we hasten it? Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. The way we hasten the coming of the Lord is by preaching the gospel. And then, of course, Revelation chapter 21. Um, this one is a beautiful passage. Verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And behold, a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying. There will be no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So, in the end, what's going to bring an end, our, our eschatological view, according to the Bible, is human-made climate change isn't going to destroy the earth. God will come, cleanse the earth, and recreate a new earth back to that Eden stat place, where I believe we'll still have dominion over the earth. We'll still be caring for it, just like we were before, but won't be, it won't be opposing us. So it won't, it won't be a, a challenge, a difficult thing for us. So, um, so how do we care for the earth? Obviously, responsible stewardship, right? The easiest thing is not trashing the place. I'm from New Mexico. I love the state. It's a beautiful state. But when you drive along, there's trash everywhere. No respect for it. Part of it, I think, is the climate, like... There's not enough moisture for stuff to decay. If you throw something out here, it's going to decay in not too long. Out there, it'll stay forever because it's dry. Um, but still, it's just trashy, isn't it? A Christian should think tw 
twice before they just pitch something out the window, right? Um, I think we should care for it in, in that if we realize something we're doing is harming the earth needlessly, then go ahead and make other plans. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the things that we're asked to do by environmentalists are actually good things, right? Use less plastics that can't be, that don't decay very easily. Why not? That's a good idea, right? It's not so much a moral thing, it's not a sin to have a plastic container that we need to atone through, through some penance, but when we're caring for the earth, we're not doing it from a position of fear, but rather out of respect for God and what he has given us. God gave us this earth. It's a treasure. He gave it to us. Wow, thank you, Lord. I want to do the best I can to care for it. And does that mean you don't cut out, down a tree? No, it probably just means that you cut down a tree, but then you plant another one. You know? Um, I've heard that up in the Northwest, there's actually more trees now, more acre feet, of, board feet of, of trees than before they started logging because the logging industry realized if they just cut trees, they'll be out of business in not too long. So they cut trees and they plant them. It's a crop. It's now a crop. And anything that's a crop, people are making money off of, there's going to be more of, right? So yes, we're losing rainforest because they haven't quite figured that out, but responsibly source trees, they actually are increasing the amount of, of trees that are available in a lot of areas. So we, we care for the earth as a treasure that God, as God has given us and as a responsibility to him. We're stewards of the earth, not because we're afraid of it. And so we want to be responsible to care for it until Jesus comes and wipes it out and starts fresh. And that's, that's the exciting part. So next time, which will not be next week, but the following week, we're going to talk about royal identity, our identity connected with God. So this one is less about earthly falseness and more about heavenly truth that has been largely ignored still. So, all right. Any thoughts about this topic tonight? Yeah, Heather. Thoughts as you were um, talking about this. You know, we worship God. You know, as you know, as Seventh Day Adventists, we focus on God as our Creator. That's why we have the Seventh Day is such you know important because it's it marks the creation of the world and all this kind of stuff. And we worship God as our Creator. And um, the environmentalists in this religion that you're talking about, they are worshiping the Earth as their Creator. <laughs> and you know, and our our focus as Christians is not so much, I mean, not that the earth isn't important, but um, our job as Christians is to rescue the people from the earth. That's why we focus on evangelism more than environmentalism, because in our worldview, we know this world isn't going to last. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we want to save as many people as we can. And um, for environmentalists, you know, seculars, this world is all we've got. Yep. And so there is that fear factor. So, anyway. And maybe that's why an evolutionist would want to keep, you know, take care of the earth because it is all we've got in their mind. Well, we're stretching it out to Saturn now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go colonize Mars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what they would think of that because if you colonize Mars, you're going to have to change their ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for giving us this planet to inhabit as imperfect as it is because of well, what we've done to it. And I pray that we will be able to know how to be faithful stewards of this planet without letting that become our religion, keeping you as a focus. And I pray in general that Christians will be more aware of our responsibility to care for what you've given us 
so that it's not just those who are opposed to you who try to take care of things, but we can truly take on our responsibility of tending and caring for the earth. Um, but most importantly, that we can prepare other people to leave the earth when you come and make all things new. In Jesus' name, amen.